Okay. Um, I've already the set again from Exo Arena. And uh, it's a collaboration between me and Jonah, uh, my app developer, and my friend Yuri, who is a digital designer and a teacher, and has learned the set from New York. Um, I'm just going to sort of give you a flavor of what we normally do. This is our first game. Uh, we don't really know anything about games. Uh, we didn't before we did this. <laughs> so a few other projects we've done. This is a little stuffed heart that beats. Uh, and, uh, it has some sensors and it tries to match your heartbeat. It's a little sort of calming toy for kids. This is something Yuri made. Um, this is, if you see below the big ceramic sort of analog menorah, there's a little digital LED menorah uh, on the bottom. There's a little lifestyle gadget that Yuri makes. Uh, it's a sort of toy. Um, this is something I did a few years ago. It's a huge wall uh, with lots of numbers. It's a memorial to uh, victims of a cr uh, humanitarian crisis in Darfur. And if people gave a dollar, one of the lights would turn on. And the object was to raise half a million dollars. Um, so this is some of the kind of stuff we've done before. Um, all sorts of weird digital projects. Uh, but Exo Arena is our first game. So let me just, um, instead of describing it, I'll show you our little trailer, oops, for the game. Okay, so um, I guess, yeah, we're, we're, I guess there's probably equal numbers of game developers and just people interested in games here. So I just want to sort of describe the game and then also tell you some uh, things we learned while making this type of game, this kind of weird type of game that you play outside. Um, I don't think there's too many games like it, and we learned some hard lessons in making up its like For the game developers, I wanted to communicate some of those uh, lessons. So first of all, these are the rules of the game. You play with two or four players. You have to find a big open space about the size of a soccer field or a park. Um, each person needs an iPhone or an iPad. And you basically just run around trying to shoot each other. You tap your phone to shoot. The control is extremely simple. Um, if you get hit five times and you're out, uh, and the last person standing wins the game. Um, so that's that's sort of like the simplest version of the game, like the first version that you play. Um, and then if you're into the game, and as you sort of master the control, um, you can play more advanced levels, which are called arenas, hence the name of the game, Exo Arena. Uh, and these levels are composed of different features. So here's the catalog of features that we have in the game. The, Blue lines are shelters, the, which protect you. The blue, sorry, the blue circles are shelters. The blue lines are ricochets, which reflect and accelerate bullets. And the uh, yellow zigzags are hazards, which injure you if you go in them. And these things are actually layered on top of the real world. So if you're playing in a park, you'll look down at your phone and you'll see like, okay, over there there's a shelter. You have to run to that area. Uh, to go in the shelter, which will then protect you from the bullets that other people are um, are firing at you. So, I mean, does that make sense? Okay. Sometimes I have trouble describing this game to people. It's good to know that uh, it sort of makes sense. Um, so let me show you. It's kind of hard to demonstrate this game, since you have to be outside. So I'll show you a little video of the gameplay, and I'll sort of narrate what's happening. So just imagine some people running around in the park doing stuff. Uh, while this video is playing on their phone. So they're kind of running around and then looking at, down at the phone to check out what's going on. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of narrate what's going on. So this is the beginning. This is where you're selecting an arena. So you can see these, these different environments that are composed of those elements that I described before. So we chose voltage, uh, which is one where you have to avoid the yellow areas. Now it's uh, locating us with GPS. And this is all happening on your iPhone. Move terrains. OK. To start the game, you have to move into these starting areas. Um, OK, I'm the purple guy. I'm in the middle. So as I move my body around, you can see the, you know, the environment changes just like you're using the Maps app. OK. I went in the yellow thing, so I got hurt. I meant to play this at double speed, it's a little boring. But. <laughs> Is this real speed? Like real time? So can you actually dodge bullets? Yeah, you can dodge bullets, yeah. 
It looks kind of slow. Like this wouldn't be fun as a console game, obviously. I mean, maybe it would have like in 1978 or something. <laughs> but um, when you're playing outside, it's actually pretty fast. Um, and you're trying to simulate the real world and the world on your phone. And so what looks really slow here is actually pretty fast paced. Um, and at the end of the game, you get a little stats thing, like you're playing a real time, sh real time, uh, or a first person shooter. Some guy on Twitter called this an AR FPS, uh, which I thought was a nice, concise way to say it. It's like a FPS, but you know, you know you're actually shooting people. In. <laughs> I mean, not actually shooting people. It's <laughs> close to an FPS as you can legally get. It. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, how did I do this? Or not, just sites are, are really not. Sorry? What sites does the arena have in real? Uh, the arena is 100 meters diameter. So it's like a soccer field. Yeah. Okay, so I mentioned that we'd never made any games before. And we're not rich, at least I'm not. <laughs> So that begs the question, why did we do this project? Um, and the answer, there's a couple answers. One is that um, both Yuri and I are children of the 80s. And originally, Yuri came to me with the idea of making the Light Cycles game. Do you guys remember the Light Cycles scene from Tron? So and originally, we actually made the Light Cycles game. So instead of running around shooting people, you'd run around and you'd leave a little trail of light. And if the other guy ran into your trail of light, um, he would die. But it turned out this game was not fun. <laughs> yeah, we made it. We really polished it, too. It was like ready to go. And then we were like, no, this is too much running. <laughs> and actually, my friend who's sitting over here, Dan, sort of flew me into that. Um, it was a lot of running. But that was the original inspiration. It was this idea of melding real and virtual and sort of giving you we wanted to, we like games like this, and we wanted to sort of feel like we were in that world. Um, another game I loved, I don't know if any, you guys are probably maybe a little too young to remember this game, but this is called Gato. Does anybody know Gato? It's a submarine simulator. This game was so dumb, it was like linked to the clock speed of the computer, so when they came out with the 286, like you couldn't play it anymore because it was too fast. Uh, I thought that was funny. Um, anyway, I love this game, another simulation game. And then this is probably my favorite game of all time, was TIE Fighter. Um, not just the simulation, but the mood. Uh, so these are kind of all the influences when we were thinking about what kind of game we might want to make. <clears throat> so that's the first answer. We're children of the 80s that love these games. But we also love sports, so Yuri and I both used to play soccer. We like the physical, you know, the physical action and sort of the personal relationships that you make when you're playing sports. And those really are like the most popular games in the world. I mean, I've seen kind of mixed posture towards sports in the game community. I'm kind of rather new to the game community and some people really don't like sports. Um, but I think there's a lot to be learned from sports because those really are the most popular games in the world, you know. Um, and then third, we, we're trying to make a game that like there's, in the US especially, there's this epidemic of childhood obesity and a lot of studies link that to increased screen time. So kids sitting in front of the computer and the, and the, and the Xbox or whatever. So we wanted to make a game that would go against that um, trend and maybe provide a bridge for kids. So something they're familiar with and thought would be fun, but would get them out of the house. Um, and then lastly, this is a pretty challenging game to make, so technically and design-wise. So it's, it, seemed, it seemed like fun. Um, so that's the why of it. Um, I thought for like in-game devs or people interested in that, uh, I would just say sort of how this works. Um, so there's, you saw at the beginning of the game where I created, the person picked the arena and created a match. And when that happens, everybody else around them, that match just pops up on their phone. Everybody else who's running the app. And that's accomplished with Bluetooth. There's multi-peer connectivity? Um, do you mean like that framework in iOS? It's not, doesn't use multi-peer connectivity and I can tell you why it doesn't use that in a slide or two. Um, it uses this homegrown thing. Um, next, when you're actually playing the game, it uses GPS to locate you. And then lastly, um, obviously the two or three phones have to 
uh, coordinate, it uses the cellular data to transmit uh, the player's position, their heading, and any actions they take among the phones. So it sort of uses these three different wireless technologies in concert uh, to make this experience. And these three, um, these three wireless technologies are all vital to this game, which I thought was kind of curious, because just a few years ago, even like three years ago, or two years ago, you really couldn't access these things programmatically, especially the Bluetooth, in a widely de deployed platform. <clears throat> so that's kind of the how of it. Here are some challenges we had when trying to implement that. Um, and I'll answer your, your question first, which is the second bullet. Um, th there's this thing called multi-peer connectivity on iOS, which will sort of just like find a local a person for you. It'll scan the area and it'll hand you a Bluetooth connection or a Wi-Fi connection that you can then use to trans transmit data between the players. Unfortunately, that doesn't really work for us because um, our our uh, what's the right word the 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 space in which we play the game is really big. It's got to be 100 meters wide because the GPS is so inaccurate. You need a really big space to make this game work. And also, like, if you have four people running around, you don't want them to be running around in, like, a little 20-meter circle. <laughs> That's no fun. Um, so we need a really wide area. And those that multi-peer connectivity, unfortunately, gives you these Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connections that have a very short range, like 100 feet sometimes for Bluetooth. And Wi-Fi is, like, you just never know. Um, so what we needed was we needed something that would link you with nearby players, but then would allow for um, playing over a wide area. So we just like rolled our own version of that, um, basically. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the second bullet point here. Uh, the first bullet point was really more of a design challenge and implementation challenge. And when you play this game, I think What's really hard when you're playing the game is to harmonize the real world with the virtual world that you see on your phone. You don't necessarily know where all the bullets are or where the features on the field are, and you have to imagine, based on what you see on your phone, that, oh, there's like a shelter over there that I can run to. Um, so in order to make this as easy as possible for the players, we made the, the, the UI really stark and really high contrast, as you probably saw, and really simple, like, like, a, like a 70s game. Uh, we wanted it to look not like you know a high def video game, but like a like a heads up display or like a dashboard in a car. Uh, but even so, if you play the game, that design challenge wasn't totally met because um, it's actually still quite hard to kind of be looking down at the phone and looking up. And really, this game would work better as a Google Glass game or something like that. Um, thirdly, um, GPS lag and jitter is a huge problem. The GPS gives you a 10, um, a 10 meter radius circle. So when you're playing this game, you think you're just a human, but actually the game sees you as this enormous object. Okay, uh, and there's also jitter. So GPS will sometimes just like jump 10 meters. So in the game, you'll appear to just skip. Um, so these are problems um, that we sort of notice as we went along. We tried to accommodate them, but but really they're intractable technically at least at this point, and they need to be built into the design of the game. So a friend of mine suggested that maybe we should have used the metaphor of a boat or a submarine, because if you're piloting this, you sort of expect some inertia and some lag between the control and the action. Um, so maybe that's a design. We have this like abstract triangle that you are. Probably we should have used some design metaphor that would prepare you for that kind of inertia. Uh, have you thought about using a wireless network? If, I mean, if someone creates a hotspot and you can track what's that in this triangle, it could be maybe more precise. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Um, I think the problem is you'd have it's to just have... an idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a good avenue. I think we wanted to try to minimize setup <coughs> and things like that. Um, and then sort of the last challenge here was variable network conditions. So when Lorenzo and us were playing in the park, the other day, uh, some people just kept losing their connection, and it's kind of astounding how much network conditions vary from carrier to carrier and place to place, and it's almost impossible to know or to test that. Um, so that's a problem we continually run into. Um, I'm not trying to like dissuade you. I want everybody to make more games like this, <laughs> um, but these are things to just think about if you do want to make an outdoor game, especially a real-time outdoor game. 
any any pointers on how long it took you just to set that up? Just like for the hardware, just for the hard parts? Like the infrastructure under the game? It took a long time to be honest with you. It probably took like three months of just working on like getting people connected properly and we have a server, so um, I didn't want to go totally too deep, but to answer your question, we don't just route the data between the phones, we actually bounce them off a server on the internet um, because uh, that decreases the overall latency. Um, and we had to figure that out and then design the server and that took a couple weeks. And yeah. What I'd like to do, I mean, I don't know if there's any interest in this, but there's a couple components that people could definitely use for other games. So I was thinking of wrapping those up and making them available. <coughs> Um, I was at um, I was at talk I was at join uh, the conference that Sioris and Lorenzo organized a couple weeks ago, and I, I was always interested in how people made uh, made these games because it's hard financially. So I thought I would just say a little about that. Um, our game was self finance, which basically means we just decided to take off work for a while and spend some money. Um, and I worked full time for about nine months, and my partner Yuri worked on the weekends for the same amount of time. And then we hired contractors to do like that video um, YouTube, or that video trailer thing, and for the sound and the art. Um, so, you know, there wasn't a lot of outlay. We spent a couple thousand dollars on these contractors, but there was a huge opportunity cost in that, you know, game developers can get paid pretty well. So if you factor like nine months of salary, that was kind of our investment in the game. Um, and. Uh, the results of our investments are sort of mixed, I would say. Uh, we've been accepted into a, a nice festival. Do you guys know Come Out and Play in New York? It's like it's a it's a it's a festival where the city turns into a playground for a day and a night, and there's all sorts of big games and outdoor games. And it's really cool, and we were accepted into that and um, got a lot of people out and playing and got some good coverage. <clears throat> we got coverage in the Wall Street Journal and the New Yorker. Admittedly, small pieces of coverage, but um, that was pretty good. And we've gotten really good reviews, so everybody that plays the game seems to love the game, and we have like all five star reviews. Even though the game doesn't work like super great, it works okay, but it's not perfect. <laughs> we still have lots of really positive reviews in the App Store, and people seem to like the game and appreciate the game. So that's kind of the good stuff. And then this big space in the middle of the slide separates the good stuff and bad stuff. <laughs> We don't have many downloads, so 2,100 downloads in about three months. You can figure that, it's uh, not very many. Uh, the way you you can buy extra arenas, so we have about 250 arenas that people have bought. Unfortunately, most of those have been free because we have done some giveaways. Um, and we've seen people play about 6,000 games of Exo Arena. Um, it, this guy, Adrian, at, at uh, Join the other week said that his game, I think it was Friends Trap, which is a really great game, had made enough money to buy a couple burgers, and that's where we're at right now, too. So, um, anyway, I guess to summarize this slide, I'm actually pretty happy with the game and the work, um, but financially speaking, at least the way we've done it so far, it's not even close to sustainable. So, I'd be interested to know if people have ideas or have different experiences or, or whatever. Okay, just a couple words about how you can help. You can download the game, follow me, and if anybody knows people that would be interested in writing about this kind of game, I would love to make those contacts, because thus far we really haven't gotten much like mentioned in the games press, and we don't have many contacts at all in the games industry since we come from different places. And that's it. <laughs>